It is my pleasure to introduce Rhonda Moniz. Um, she's been in the marine technology industry for over 20 years and has worn many hats, including dive safety officer, ROV pilot, and underwater forensics consultant. She has also worked as a journalist and filmmaker and is currently sales manager for oceanographic programs at Woods Hole Group. She is also president of the Marine and Oceanographic Technology Network, an organization that I helped found, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and it's still alive and well, and representing the uh, marine environmental and engineering businesses and organizations locally here in the region. So with that, Rhonda, um, I just want to tell you to go ahead with your panel, and, and you've got a really good group of people to um, keep on track. And I do believe that Bill Stavi has not arrived yet. So correct me if I'm wrong, if we're going to start with um, Phil Stropman. Am I correct? Um, let's see. <clears throat> I was not aware that Bill had not arrived yet. So we can do that. We can roll here with the punches. OK. Philip, you, are you good with that? Excellent. Absolutely. OK. Um, well, thank you, Maggie. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, yes, uh, I am, I'm, I'm very involved in the industry and have been for quite some time. And um, also, in addition, I wanted to mention, too, that if you are interested, I also do a podcast uh, called Sea State with the oceanographic, um, with our ONT, the the um, Ocean News and Technology magazine. So if you're interested in, we have a lot of really great conversations with people in the industry. So you can just look up ONT and, and, and find C State on the website. We've had some nice chats. So um, I also want to take a minute to thank you guys for having me as the moderator. And um, as we are all uh, aware, the marine renewable energy sector is set to play a unique role within a number of market segments and applications and enabling new capabilities and economic development. Uh, while marine energy is a dynamic and rapidly growing sector of the blue economy, it's also true that other sectors rely on access to consistent, reliable power to achieve their needs. So aligning innovation in the blue economy with recent advances in marine energy technology could provide solutions for both legacy and emerging industries that meet economic, social, and environmental goals. And so in our panel, our next panel, panel three for this afternoon, um, our panelists will highlight examples of re, uh, marine renewable energy technologies that are designed to enable the growth and electrification of traditional and emerging blue economy industries. So we have had a little change in the lineup here. So we have uh, Philip Stratman up first. He is an experienced commercial executive with a proven track record of establishing and growing businesses in new markets with a focus on clean energy. He has focused on decarbonization and autonomous offshore marine operations to support healthy oceans and mitigating climate change. Previously managed, uh, he previously managed the development of onshore renewable fuels projects, including CCUS and associated carbon credits. So Philip, why don't you take it away for us? Yes, th th thank you, Rhonda. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Rhonda said, I'm Philip Stratman. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Ocean Power Technologies. I'm coming to you from uh, Houston, Texas. And it's uh, my pleasure to present to you. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to UMass for allowing us to participate amongst so many experts in this field. I would also like to acknowledge DOE and particularly the WPTO for continuing to drive this, this conversation forward. As a public company listed on the NASDAQ, I do need to draw your attention to the safe harbor provisions related to forward-looking statements. And I wanted to give you a brief overview of OPT and what we've been up to. Uh, we're a pioneer and world leader in wave energy technology. We hold more than 60 patents, primarily for the insides of our systems um, and have several others pending. We've been around since the 1980s. We're a public company traded on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange that has deployed offshore power and communication solutions worldwide. We have a pretty diverse team um, in engineering with a deep expertise in electrical, mechanical, ocean, and hydrodynamic engineering. We have a projects and operations team that has hands-on marine experience. And our global headquarters, which you can see here in the background, in New Jersey, where we have a just under 60,000 square foot production facility with a design center, test bay, 
electromechanical assembly and integration. We do have a regional office here in Houston, Texas, and a growing commercial representation in Europe and Asia, particularly focused on the North Sea and the South China Sea. All of our solutions are developed on the basis of our three core products, which you can see here on this slide, which is the PV3 wave power buoy, the hybrid power buoy, which is in the background, and the subsea battery for energy storage on the seabed, which is in the foreground. And as you will see during my presentation, our focus is on providing non-grid connected clean power for industries operating in our vast oceans. This is a short video of the PB3 and how it operates. Um, I come from the oil and gas industry offshore. It's just a, a basic spa ultimately, but a mini version of it. And in the seaway, the float collar moves up and down on the spa body that sits below the surface. That in turn drives the generator, produces the electricity, which we store in the battery bank that sits within the spa. Important to note, we, we never draw any power directly from the generator. We, we power everything from the energy stored in the batteries and use the battery, use the generator to trickle charge our battery systems. So what you can see here, this is the kind of the first of our solutions that we've got. This is our marine surveillance solution incorporates radar, video camera, and a, an AIS detector to give you always on-site monitoring with secure real-time data and alerts back to an onshore operation center. That way around, you can get 24-7, 365 warning to marine users, regardless of the weather. It reduces the need for on-site personnel exposure and materially reduces operational costs. It also is based on a renewable power system, therefore has zero emissions. Here you can see some additional views of this surveillance system and the ability for us to collect large amounts of monitoring data from the ocean. The embedded software enables tracking of multiple targets, which can be handed over from buoy to buoy when a multi-buoy array is deployed. Specific examples of this system are using renewable power for illegal, unregulated and undocumented fishery um, activities. And it, it, you can essentially you deploy this as a maritime border surveillance solution to protect natural resources. But we don't just provide above surface solutions. We also provide subsea power solutions. These range from providing power to critical subsea infrastructure to enable persistent and resident subsea vehicle operations. And those can be tethered or autonomous. And what you see here is a picture of our deployment in the Mediterranean for ENI, where our buoy was moored near an existing oil platform for just about two years. And we had an umbilical going down to the seabed to simulate uh, AUV operations on, on, on the seabed. Another subsea power application is open sea laboratories. Um, as you can see here on the left, it's a schematic that we're deploying in Chile for Enel Green Power. And this can entail monitoring of ocean conditions as well as fish or mammal, mammal movement. The latter can also be combined with our surface surveillance solutions. This specific application that you see here is designed to detect currents, salinity, temperatures, and so on and so forth in the water column, and then provide that data on a 24-7 basis back to the shore. And on the right here, you see a picture of our hybrid buoy, um, which is our, our other floating product that we have in our arsenal. And we recognize not everywhere and not every project is suitable for wave power device. As I mentioned, this is why we've developed the hybrid buoy. It was developed to enable customers to benefit from clean power when a project calls for shorter deployment, you know, less than a year, and or is located in calm water regions. It can be easily installed, fits the same kind of payloads as the PV3, i.e. surface power, surface solution um, or, or subsea power, utilizes solar panels together with an efficient backup Stirling engine. And that gives you about a megawatt hour of storage and also has batteries uh, included on the system. Talking about batteries, I mentioned right at the very beginning, we have a subsea battery. Our subsea battery was developed really to fit two primary needs. One is additional storage on the seabed to be combined with our buoy products. And the other one is standalone backup power for critical infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, 
we will work with our partners to integrate all of our solutions into deployment ready system. All of which, as I mentioned right at the very beginning, is focused on non-grid applications. So we help decarbonize those hard to reach areas of the ocean and enable autonomous over the horizon operations. Here you can just see a couple of more pictures of the PV3. Uh, this is in Aberdeen in Scotland, just before it was deployed in the North Sea where it, uh, it survived an entire winter season. Um, and uh, this is the one of the uh, integrated surveillance solutions that you can see. As you can see, for those of us coming from the offshore industry, it's a fairly small system. It's pretty compact. And you can fit about three of them for deployment onto your typical anchor handler. So in summary, we can support and enable active surface monitoring to deter illegal fishing, for example, provide long-term deployments to safeguard and monitor marine protected areas and other sensitive areas of the ocean, such as wind farm construction zones, and we can provide clean power to subsea infrastructure. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to any questions further on throughout the panel. Thanks, Philip. Appreciate that. And you're so on time, which is great as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so next up, we have Dr. Daniel McDonald, who is a professor at uh, the University of Massachusetts, um, their SMAS campus. He's a civil and environmental engineering professor. And Daniel, are you ready and set to go? Professor, you're muted. I am muted. So actually, it's actually Greg that's going to be giving the, the presentation from our end, but I am okay. uh, ready to go and standing by and I'll let him take it away. Excellent. Then we, that's right. We have two of you on this um, particular. So, okay, great. Then let's, um, let's start that then the next process. Sorry, one second. I'm just bringing up the uh, slides. I thought we were going back to Bill, but I can uh, I'll just take Is one. Bill here? Uh, Bill is now here. Yes. It, Okay. Yes, I'm here, Rhonda. Okay. Um, so Whatever you want to do, though, I don't care. <laughs> I can wait. Yeah, it's uh, that's fine. All right, I'll go. I'll back. I'll, I'll stick to the original plan. Yeah, I, I wasn't. Uh, I didn't get any note or anything that he arrived. So yeah, we can go back to Bill. That's okay. fine. Right. You should be getting notifications in the chat. If you just want to keep your eye out for that. Okay. Okay, let me just bring up Bill's information now. <clears throat> uh oh, that I knew this would happen. Uh oh, what does <laughs> yeah. that mean? That means that the video wasn't supposed to start. So I think it'll start right after this. I, I'll do some introductory comments and then I will start the video and then we'll move onward from there. But uh, help. Yeah, I can give you a little, I can give people a little bit of background for you, Bill, while that's going too, if you like. Oh, okay. Yeah, just go ahead and start, Rhonda, then, and uh, then I'll start as soon as you're finished. Okay, great. Um, so, um, Bill here is the CEO, co-founder, actually, and CEO of the Boston-based Resolute Marine Energy Incorporated, RME, which is developing a technology that harnesses the energy of ocean waves to provide clean water and electricity for remote and off-grid communities. RME currently has projects under development in Oregon and two countries on the African continent. So there you go, Bill, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. And thanks uh, to Elise and Maggie at uh, UMass. And um, Maggie, I forget the name of your firm, but for organizing this and um, really appreciate it. Uh, just introducing Resolute Marine a little bit. Um, the company was founded in 2007, so we have been at it for 13 years. Uh, the first, uh, we very, very quickly decided that um, <clears throat> chasing after grid scale electricity production with what was going on with terrestrial wind, eventually offshore wind, PV, et cetera, was uh, not going to yield the kind of uh, business that we really wanted to uh, go forward with. So we started looking for alternative applications. Um, the first application we looked at was uh, using wave power for powering offshore aquaculture farms. Uh, and so we, um, we did some work there with a NOAA grant, uh, but um, 
quickly decided to move on to something else because although the offshore aquaculture industry will eventually grow to something very, very large, we realized that we would be only selling, you know, one, two, three <laughs> devices per year. And it's very difficult to build a business around that. So we searched for larger opportunities and we hit upon the water uh, sector. And uh, we noticed that there really was a, a growing problem of water scarcity around the world that affects a lot of people. And so since 2010, roughly, we have been developing a wave power desalination system that as the slide basically says, it uh, is uh, appropriate for off-grid areas of the world uh, to provide relief for uh, from water scarcity uh, for large populations. Uh, and I'll get to the sort of size of market that we're looking at. But uh, in our first launch market is uh, Cape Verde. So without further ado, I'll click on the, hope, hope that the presentation, the actual video works. Um, but uh, rather than doing a whole lot of hand waving about uh, sort of the sense of what we're doing and how the technology works, uh, let's uh, take a look at this video and here we go. And we're not going. There we go. Whoops. It took a second. Uh, can we go back? Thank you. Whoops. I knew this would happen. Let me click and see if it goes. Let's wait for a second. See if it comes up. And of course, I think at least what we maybe need to do is start over again. There we go. Blue planet dominated by water. In fact, water covers over 70% of the planet. But while our water resources may appear limitless, in reality, only 1% of the Earth's water is drinkable and its distribution is unfair. Today, more than 1 billion people in developing countries and island nations have no access to clean water. And as a result, a child dies of a water-related disease every 15 seconds. Add to this a rapidly increasing population, exhaustion of our surface water resources and climate change, and our water problems are only going to get worse. Most of the Earth's water is in the ocean. However, it is undrinkable by humans unless it is desalinated, and this is a costly process that requires lots of energy. However, the ocean is also where one of the cleanest and steadiest sources of energy is located, ocean waves. And that's what we do at Resolute Marine. We use ocean waves to power a desalination system and provide fresh water for people who really need it. The way it works is simple. First, a flap attached to the bottom of the sea moves back and forth with waves to capture their energy. The energy is converted into pressurized seawater that is sent to the shore where it is filtered through a process called reverse osmosis to produce fresh water. An average plant can produce 4,000 cubic meters per day of fresh water, which is enough to supply the needs of 40,000 people. By displacing fuel consumption that would have otherwise been required, carbon emissions can be reduced by 4,300 tons per year, the equivalent of taking 900 cars off the road. In short, we are developing a breakthrough technology that can help solve the global water crisis by harnessing one of the cleanest and widely available sources of energy, ocean waves. So I hope everybody could uh, hear the audio reasonably well. Um, the reason that the um, Horizon 2020 flag uh, shows it up at the end of the video is that we established several years ago a subsidiary in Ireland through which we do some of our work and uh, through which we have about six employees at this point in time. So I'll move on to the next slide. Let's see, I could use a down button. There we go. So I just wanted to be uh, clear about where this particular technology fits. Um, so as the slide basically says, um, we fit in the middle between what we call mega scale desalination plants, which are really the province of uh, developed countries and wealthy nations, if you will. Uh, and at the other end of the scale is what we call household scale solutions, um, which provide relief are, are good, but provide relief for a very small number of people. So um, in that medium scale, uh, area we see as the main competition diesel driven systems and 
I'll give a little bit of an example for the Cape, what's going on in Cape Verde. Um, it is one of the driest countries in the African continent. Um, and 85% of the country's water supply is provided by desalination plants. And 100% of those desal plants are driven by diesel driven systems. So the country has a huge addiction to fossil fuels, um, which causes as a result, um, a lot of risks that they would rather avoid, but also one of the highest costs of water uh, on the planet, frankly. So it's an ideal uh, launch market for us because we can uh, fit in there with a profitable uh, solution for our off-taker customer, which is the local water and electric utility, um, and uh, take our, our business uh, starting there uh, moving forward. Bill, just a heads up, you've got one more minute. Okay. Um, so then this, these are some of the countries where we're working. Um, uh, obviously, Cape Verde is uh, primary amongst those, but we've been developing um, uh, business opportunities elsewhere. This is the commercial pilot site where we will actually be deploying the system. Uh, this is uh, called Praia Grande. It's in the island of Sao Vicente in, in, uh, in Cape Verde. Uh, this is our commercialization roadmap. Uh, right now, we are doing techno technology validation work in our lab in Hingham, Massachusetts. Next step is to do a technical pilot at Plocon in the Grand in the Canary Islands. Our commercial pilot plant will done be done in the 2022-2023 timeframe uh, in Cape Verde, and then we expect to be installing five plants um, in the 2023 to 2025 time period. An important aspect of what we're doing is to satisfy as many of these uh, sustainable development goals from the United Nations. Um, and we've uh, spotlighted about nine of those that in which we fit. So that's an important aspect for our funding strategy, quite frankly, as well. That's basically the end at this point in time. I look forward to questions. And again, thanks uh, to Maggie and Elise for putting this together and uh, also to the Department of Energy for their ongoing funding that they've given us over the years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bill, much appreciated. And <clears throat> next up, we have Gregory Brown, who is the um, graduate student at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. He's gonna be driving the um, next presentation with uh, Professor McDonald in the wings. So when we get to the end of the uh, panel speakers and we start asking questions, we'll have uh, Professor McDonald here as well. So uh, Greg, without further ado, uh, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Rhonda. As she said, my name is Gregory Brown. I graduated from UMass Dartmouth this past spring with a BS in mechanical engineering, and I'm currently enrolled as a graduate student here. I'd like to talk to you about the MADWAC, which stands for Maximal Asymmetric Drag Wave Energy Converter. It was the UMass Dartmouth entry into the 2020 Marine Energy Collegiate Competition where we came in second place and the subject of my senior design project. I had the privilege of being the team leader for both of these endeavors and advancing this technology is part of my current graduate work. So why MADWEC? Maximal asymmetric drag refers to the tethered ballast device shown at the bottom. Most point observers have a heavy steel spar which is used to stabilize, stabilize the device vertically in the water, allowing the buoy to move against it. This method of stabilizing is costly both in construction and deployment. I'll explain how it works in a moment, <clears throat> but the tethered ballast device allows us to get rid of the heavy steel spar. This allows the MADWEC to reduce both cost and weight without giving up efficiency, which positions us to take advantage of several market opportunities. Things like remote charging AUVs, which would allow normal AUVs to become resident AUVs, which can stay on station, long-term monitoring stations, even telecommunications across the water. So how does it work? As the wave approaches, the buoy at the surface dips into the trough. The tethered ballast louvers hinge open and allow water to pass through, allowing the entire system to drop in the water column. As the crest of the wave approaches, the buoy tries to pull the system up, but the, but the louvers on the tethered ballast hinge closed causing a significant amount of added mass and drag. This keeps the PTO and ballast relatively fixed in the water column while the buoy rises on the wave crest. As it does so, it pulls a line that is wound around a reel which translates the linear motion into rotary motion, 
which is used by the generators to create electricity. Two important pieces to note here are the one-way clutch and the torsion spring. While the buoy is pulling the line out, the rotary motion tightens the spring and engages the slipped clutch to transmit torque to the generators. While the buoy is riding into the next trough, the spring unwinds, keeping constant tension on the line between the buoy and the PTO. During this time, the one-way clutch is disengaged, which allows the flywheel to continue spinning the generators with any excess energy from the previous wave until the next wave gives the system another pull. This causes the MADWEC to function like a pull start lawnmower, but instead of starting an engine, we're generating electricity. The graph you see on the right were generated from a MATLAB model for the first generation of MADWEC, which was mainly designed to prove that the tethered ballast system could replace a steel spar. The top graph shows the buoy following the free surface as you would expect with the PTO and ballast situated below and only moving a small amount. The bottom graph is the same as the top graph, just with the voltage superimposed over it, showing that we could generate power on the entire upstroke of the wave. Further improvements to the design are expected to improve and smooth out these results by the addition of a flywheel and charge controller, as well as swapping out generators and keeping the PTO and ballast situated below the wave energy. The blue economy market has started to shift away from grid scale in favor of self-charging or remote power operations. These small scale devices make up for their shortcomings by being incredibly affordable. To put it into perspective, for the price of one Palamis P2, you could have 2,600 MADWEX, meaning that you'd get more power per dollar, you can distribute this power over a much larger area, and the loss of a single unit or even several, several won't impact your bottom line. The MADWEX system has been in development for, for several years now, starting with the tethered ballast when my then my senior design group took on the task of building a PTO that would capitalize on the strengths of the tether, tethered ballast. This year's senior design group is working on building and testing that prototype to fine tune the device and make further improvements while I focus my graduate studies on improving the tethered ballast. We're currently looking for industry partners who can help us with the long duration sea trials. The idea is to build upon the patent portfolio that we already have, license the designs out to the industry then get feedback about how to make it better suit the needs of the licensees in order to make design improvements, which we then patent and license out again. Having at least one industry partner would enable us to achieve our vision for the future. The MADWEC wasn't just designed to take advantage of a few market opportunities. It was designed with the idea of shifting the paradigm of how we do exploration and research in the ocean. This image was taken from the NOAA website and shows over 1400 moorings which currently power themselves using 20 watt photovoltaic cells. 20 watts is hardly enough to keep up with increasing energy demands and they don't work at night. <clears throat> but if each of these had a MADWEC unit attached, then it would be able to provide all the power necessary for onboard systems and have enough left over to share. If you had an AUV that could go hundred miles on a charge, then it, would, then it could travel up and down either side of the US until you decided to pull it out for maintenance. Imagine what your companies could do if there was an outlet every 100 miles in the ocean. Imagine what kinds of new markets could emerge with this kind of electrical availability. Just as Tesla's charging stations will one day be in every town, we see the MADWEC becoming the go-to charging station in the ocean. Right now, doing work in the ocean is time consuming, expensive, and requires many people with various backgrounds. Widespread use of technology allows more work to be done cheaper, faster, and with less people. We believe that MADWEC is the linchpin technology that will enable the use of other ocean going technologies. But we aren't the only people who thought the MADWEC was a really great idea. During the 2020 Marine Energy Collegiate Competition, we got a lot of great feedback from the coordinators, judges, and industry experts that we met along the way. We also faced some pretty tough competition, and we couldn't have done it without the help of my whole team and the guidance from our advisors. We ended up taking second place and we scored the highest in the technical design portion and we're only 11 points away from taking first place. Also, we won the best poster award. Thank you all for your time and attention. I will leave you with this SolidWorks animation showing the one-way clutch turning oscillating rotary motion into one-way rotary motion. Thank you, Gregory, for that. <clears throat> and congratulations on getting second place. That's awesome.
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so next up, we have uh, Stuart Davies. He is the CEO of ORPC. Um, his focus at ORPC is on driving growth and prof profitability through overseeing the commercial rollout of the company's proven technology in the US, Canada, and Chile. Prior to leading ORPC, Stuart was an investor in early stage companies with a primary focus on companies with products and services that either reduce carbon emission or improve the health of the environment. He brings nearly two decades experience to ORPC as chief investment officer and portfolio manager in the financial services industry, during which he served on the boards of dozens of companies in the energy, manufacturing, food, consumer product, retail, and packaging industries. So um, Stuart, are you ready with your presentation? Um, I am, can you hear me okay? Uh, yep, perfect, You can. Great. I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, Rhonda, thank you for that introduction. And Elise, thanks for all your work in putting this together. And thank you to UMass Dartmouth for inviting us here today. Um, I'm here to talk about our uh, ATGU, or uh, Autonomous Generator Unit. I don't have control of, oh, there we go. So what you're seeing on the video is our ATGU. This was uh, a video taken from the university, the tank at the University of Maine, where we conducted uh, two different series of trials. As you can see, um, we're known for our cross-flow turbine technology, and we applied that uh, where we where we'll pitch the foils, enabling this device to move forward in the water, backward dive, and resurface. We also did a, a brief ocean test out in Cops Cook Bay, Maine, which you're seeing here at the end of the video. Um, a little background on ROPC. We were formed in 2004. We have 28 employees. Our headquarter is, headquarters are in Portland, Maine. Um, we also have employees in Seattle, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, Montreal, and uh, Dublin. Um, and we've worked with a number of industry partners over the years to help develop our technology. Um, is um, we, we were probably better known for our RivGen power system, which is in Igiagig, Alaska, as you can see in the pictures there. Um, and I was going to, um, um, as you can see, over the last uh, 10 years, we've had, um, you know, a, a number of innovations in the sector in uh, 2010. We had the largest ocean energy device deployed in the US in 2014 and 15. Um, we developed our self-deployment ballast system, which is, allows our 30 ton rib gen device to be lowered uh, to the river or ocean bottom and resurfaced uh, at, a, at a push of a button. Um, and um, we have our first commercial system, which is our rib gen power system out in Igiaga, Alaska. And I'm here today to talk about the ATGU, um, but I first wanted to give a brief update on the RibGen device in Igiagig. It's been deployed for 12 consecutive months. It's made over 7 million turbine rotations. Um, we operated it for a little over 100 consecutive days. Um, due to COVID, we had to, the reason we had to um, stop it was due to uh, the fish migration. Um, Igiagig, Alaska is on the Kvijak River, which is one of the largest sockeye salmon runs in the world. And uh, so we could not get people on site to do fish monitoring. Um, we survived a brutal Alaskan winter. We had a Frazeal ice event. We had negative 40 degree temperatures and um, we have video capture of over two feet of lake ice flowing over the top of our device. And yes, that is an actual drone footage. The water there is uh, actually that clear and you can uh, drink it right out of the river. It's pretty amazing. Um, back to the ATGU, um, we received funding from DOE's uh, ARPA-E um, uh, project uh, to validate our, our theory about uh, pitching the foils to, to uh, uh, generate vector thrust and also generate large thrust loads. Um, these pitching foils, as I mentioned, uh, allow the, the device to self-propel it, propel itself. Um, it can also serve as a, as a charging station. Some of our project partners on this, I mentioned um, we did testing at the University of Maine, but we also worked with Penn State and Dartmouth on, on this project. And this project uh, wound down uh, at the end of October. Um, we see a number of use cases for this technology on the military and defense side. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about UVV charging vehicles. Clearly ours is a, a fully underwater system. So our device can actually uh, sit in charging mode and um, basically become a small rib gen to generate power. 
Um, it could be used for port security, ocean passage monitoring. Um, on a mobile side, um, it can be used for site surveys and characterization. Um, it could be used for deploying or retrieving instrument packages. And then on a tethered basis, um, it could be used for subsea operations and maintenance. And as I mentioned, it has the ability to generate large, uh, large uh, thrust capabilities. And so um, from a subsea salvage operation, if you think about, um, we've seen some pictures of oil and gas infrastructure as your end of life taking, um, um, to say, uh, just, disassembling some of those operations that could be used to lift heavy things out of the water and, and literally carry them to shore. Um, where we are uh, is uh, you can see we're on a kind of a five-year development path to commercialization. Um, as I mentioned, we finished our seed trials and tank testing uh, just last month. And um, we are looking for a strategic partner to, uh, as I mentioned, a number of use cases. We're looking for a strategic partner to work with us on what we have as a, as a prototype to, to tailor it to a specific uh, mission specific uh, application. And then with the goal of, of um, taking that and building a, a, a commercial device that we can test in, in 2021. Um, as you can see, um, just some statistics on our prototype um, at, at various um, knots of current, you can see the power output it can generate from 400 watts to almost 11 kilowatts. Um, you can see the weight and at, at five knots, about 6,000 newtons of power. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. <clears throat> so, oh, that was on time too. I think that was actually a little bit short. Wow. All right. So our um, last speaker for this panel today is Yi Chao, who is the founder and CEO of SeaTrek. Um, he pioneered the Ocean Thermal Energy ha uh, Harvesting Project at NASA JPL in collaboration with his co-inventors Jack Jones and Thomas Valdez. Additionally, Yi was the PI for the Solo Trek Project, funded by the Office of Naval Research, ONR, and the follow-on project, Slocum um, Trek. An oceanographer prone to seasickness, which isn't handy when you're an oceanographer, Yi decided to study the ocean from out of space and was a project scientist for the successful Aquarius satellite mission, a $300 million NASA project that launched the first Salinity satellite where he was responsible for science, technology and engineering implementation. Yi, you ready to go? If you get your, you're all set, looks like it. Okay, great. Take it away, Yi. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you confirm you can hear me okay? Yep, can hear you great. Thank you so much. This is a great conference. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you have heard uh, quite a few uh, ocean renewable energy technologies already, uh, solar, winds, and waves uh, in our panel. Now, the previous speaker also talked about harvest energy from the ocean current. Uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, um, another source of uh, renewable energy in the ocean uh, from uh, ocean thermal energy associated with the temperature difference uh, in the vertical direction. Some of you familiar with OTEC, uh, try to uh, power, uh, provide electricity to the grid. So our technology, think about the miniaturized OTEC, uh, try to focus on uh, provide low to medium power to underwater systems, sensors, and swimming drones in this particular case. So how do I control my uh, slides? Do I control my slides? Here we go. So over the last uh, decade or so, we have been seeing exploding of ocean data collection, thanks for the robotic technology, uh, a number of different uh, uh, vehicles and being developed in the last uh, decade. We are seeing order magnitude increase of data collection comparing to traditional ship data collection. The expensive is uh, difficult to scale. Uh, so the diagram on the right, you can see over the last decade, we are collecting um, increasing amount of ocean data, thanks for the autonomous systems and the swimming drones in this case. There's a number of the under, underwater vehicles ranging from a simple float profiling uh, in the vertical direction uh, to the underwater gliders. You can swim uh, slowly to a certain location all the way to propeller-driven vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles. 
as you can imagine, as we get uh, faster uh, speed and more sophisticated and a, um, uh, capability to carry sensors, but also you have an increasing amount of price, uh, power supply, and the operation maintenance cost. So those, this is type of vehicles, uh, C-Track, you try to develop different technologies to provide uh, thermal energy to power them. Um, we develop patent technology to harvest energy from uh, temperature difference in the ocean. Ocean is warm in the surface, cold at depths. So you have this natural occurring unlimited renewable energy source. Uh, two different type of energy harvesting techniques. Uh, the old tech is familiar with the liquid to gas. You boil certain kind of working fluid and to have to convert the thermal energy into a volume expansion. And that expansion can be used to draw, turn a turbine and, and uh, generate electricity. Uh, we have a patent last year to, uh, to develop miniaturized version, both underwater and in the Arctic, we can harvest air sea temperature difference as well. Uh, what I'm going to show you today, our commercial ready technology is uh, harvesting energy from using phase changing material between solid to liquid. And that's what uh, become autonomous system. And then we can miniaturize the system so we can attach to a number of different underwater vehicles. Uh, one of the concepts, and uh, you heard the uh, charging AOV underwater already. So this is just another illustration to use thermal energy harvesting, either using liquid to gas or solid to liquid phase change to generate sufficient energy put in the storage, allow the AOVs to come in on a periodic basis. Uh, the middle panel showing an innovative concept to uh, charge AOVs through a wet connector. This is a technology developed in Northrop Grumman. We have been partnered with. Uh, we are one of the a dozen winners of this DOE in our price competition uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, on the right hand side, you can also uh, uh, rely on charging wirelessly uh, to the AOV as well. So, what I'm presenting today is a market ready uh, energy harvesting module for float on the left and the gliders on the right. This is a low powered systems and autonomous uh, disposal system uh, for the profiling float. There are thousands of these in the water. Argo program international community developed uh, 4,000 of these float measuring temperature, salinity, all the way to biogeochemicals uh, cycle and the ecosystem health. Um, we can provide energy system attached to the float essentially powers the float indefinitely to provide continuous data collection as frequent as user need and as long as the sensor last. On the right-hand panel showing the new product we're gonna release in Q1 next year is retrofitting underwater gliders the same way um, power the glider uh, for in increased endurance rather than uh, looking for a ship or swimming back to shore to replace the battery. Uh, we are able to generate electricity on the fly as the glider swim, uh, just uh, turning the temperature difference into electricity. Uh, so both of these are has been developed by uh, 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 the SBIR, SBIR program, STTRs, uh, phase one and phase two. Now we are ready to uh, uh, to sell them commercially. So we have this video in the next uh, 90 second video I'm gonna show you next. This is a, a part of the entry. One of the prize we win is DOE NOAA competition to provide green power for persistent ocean observing. So do I click play or? 100 miles off the coast of Hawaii, a float attached to SeaTrex energy module is powered by the very depths it is exploring, the ocean's temperature changes. SeaTrex founder, Dr. Yi Chow, was inspired by oceanographer Henry Stommel, who envisioned a network of 1,000 floats powered by the sea. The ocean has quite a story to tell, and floats harnessing green energy from the deep blue allow us to surface the narrative. But today's floats are not without limitations. Nearly 1,000 floats perish each year and fall to the ocean floor, along with their dead batteries. How can we sustain ocean observing without harming the ocean? SeaTrek brings Stommel's vision to life 
creating energy that is for the ocean by the ocean. Ctrex Energy Harvesting System, commercially available today, extends the life of floats indefinitely, allowing for more sensors and rapid sampling. Ctrex is ushering in a future where ocean observing is as green as the ocean is blue. A future with eco-friendly bots that are more powerful, last longer, and provide data to better predict hurricanes and protect the ocean and the lands it borders. A future where the heartbeat of our aquatic ancestor remains strong and resonant and her story endures for generations. Thank you. Happy to take your questions afterwards. Thank you, Yi. I have you and I have to catch up after this conference. I've been working with Robin Willis over at Sea Trek, so I have oh, some wow. I have some stuff to chat with you about. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, thank you. That was a great video too. I like that. Uh, wow. I have questions for the panel. Um, how about if we get everybody to turn on their video and um, audio, and then I'll let you know when because these are specific questions for specific people. So let's start with um. I've got them in two different places here. I just realized. So let's start with the Q and A. Um, oh yeah, okay. So oh, maybe they just show up in different places. Okay. <laughs> so Maggie, this was a question I asked. I was actually wondering about too, Maggie. Maggie Merrill. Um, Phil, do you have any examples of deploying arrays and explain challenges? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's it, there, there isn't really a challenge. It's it's the same as you just depend on how far away they're installed. You know, if say for example you need an array of three of them, you get a super suitably sized anchor handler or CSV, go into the location, you prelay the moorings, and you hook up the buoys. It's uh, for those of us that come from the oil and gas offshore industry, this is kind of this is no different to a rig uh, leapfrogging from well well to well on a on a on an exploration campaign. Um, the way they work together, kind of the only limitations that you really have is bandwidth. If they are too far apart from each other and you're in a region where there is no LTE network, so outside of the North Sea or the Gulf of Mexico, which is littered up to like 150 miles offshore with LTE, um, then you're relying on either they need to be close enough for long range Wi-Fi to talk to each other, or you're having to ping the signal up to the satellite and then back down to the next buoy when you're doing target handovers. So that is probably the biggest limitation. But in terms of putting them out in as multiple arrays, the for the surface surveillance software, um, depending on whether it's military grade or non-military grade, can handle multiple buoys together. And the same goes for subsea applications. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with some oil and gas companies where you know you put a cluster out to provide power to the subsea control module or the the UTA, so the umbilical termination assembly, and the wellheads directly. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Um, Stuart, this is uh, from Simon Conover. Um, hi, Stuart. Can you clarify how the RivGen unit would respond to fish migration? Is there any way you plan to provide safeguards for the fish in the future on the unit, or do you instead just plan on removing the unit as a whole? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I put a brief answer uh, in the chat, but uh, oh, we've had 12 deployments historically at ORPC. Um, during those, we've had over uh, 1 million recorded fish interactions. We have zero recorded fish injuries or fish mortalities um, over that time period. And we believe our system will be able to operate 365 days a year. Um, due to COVID, um, as part of our requirement, and this is under a, a DOE uh, funded project, and we want to thank DOE for their support over the years with this project in Igiagig, um, it was uh, as part of our um, operating license, uh, we were required to have in-person monitors um, on site for the smolt uh, migration downstream and the adult fish migration back up. Um, we were not be able, due to the res travel restrictions in Alaska, we weren't able to get those, uh, those monitors to the community. And so in, in conjunction with the village, um, we made the decision that it wasn't the appropriate way to operate under the permit. And so we shut down during the migration periods. Um, there are two separate ones. We operated in between and we have been operating, uh, you know, with, after the second migration, we had, a, uh, we brought it up for a inspection and the device has been down in the water uh, operating for the last month. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, Bill. Uh, can you talk about your greatest challenge in getting your system up and running? 
Uh, I notice you have a lab in Hingham. Oh, this is from Maggie as well. She's she's uh, currently in Hall. Um, happy to have someone like you local and uh, I know COVID has curtailed progress. So I guess I basically asking you if you could talk about your greatest challenges in getting your system up and running. Yeah, so yeah, in Hingham, we have a 5,000 square foot workshop basically where we're building um, generation one of an integrated uh, wave power desalination system. The biggest challenge uh, really is this, this, I mean, this is uh, a huge engineering uh, exercise, which, mm. um, which takes a lot of time. Uh, so the plant that you saw in the video basically is comprised of 10 different systems, separate systems. Each of those systems has separate subsystems. Each of those subsystems has separate assemblies. Those assemblies have components and one from a engineering point of view has to address each of those as you assemble basically what is uh, a viable product. And of course you need to be doing that in conjunction with international standards. Of course, I have to mention that, uh, but, uh, but also in, in looking forward to um, making sure that you can get the, um, the certificates that you need from test laboratories and certification bodies. And um, we are working with the Dutch Marine Energy Center and Lloyd's Register effectively to go through a technology qualification process, which basically it disassembles, you know, everything that you're doing looks at it and gives you um, basically conformity statements that say that you're doing the right thing in the right way. Um, so it's a huge engineering challenge. It takes a lot of time to do properly. Uh, we're using best engineering practices, thanks to our wonderful engineering team. Uh, and of course, uh, that takes a lot of money. And that's, <laughs> that's the second big challenge is raising enough money to move forward rapidly uh, through that process. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Bill. Also curious about your staff staffing in, in, in Massachusetts. How many people do you employ in Massachusetts? Um, so I saw your question, so I added it up quickly. We have six in Massachusetts and nine in Ireland, interestingly enough. Um, okay. So Ireland is okay. beating us at this point, uh, so. All right, thank you. And I had a quick, quick question for Stuart as well. Um, Stuart, I noticed on your um, presentation, you were showing the UV um, charging stations. I know in the past there've been a lot of challenges with getting those to line up correctly, and has that been rectified? So again, this is just, this is just in concept stage. So I, I think what we were, what we see is is we can be a base uh, charging station. So if you think of, um, you know, a tidal flow, we could or a ocean current, our device could sit there, and 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 charge a base station where the UUVs could then come back to and dock. So um, I I would think it would be a question of um, something that you know someone with geo um, GPS positioning could and and controls could could figure out uh, relatively quickly, but you know we, we we it's just a concept at this point. Great, thank you, Stuart. I have another question here. Someone said they'd be interested to hear OPT's transition from grid scale to powering the blue economy app applications. Yeah, sure. I'd like to talk about that. Yeah, we started off as I said we've been around since the eighties. Um, but in our current form, we've only been around for five years. So we spent the first 20 odd years of our existence chasing grid scale wave power in a huge, ridiculously sized systems um, off the coast of Hawaii, off the coast of Scotland, tested all over the place. And about five years ago, I think our, our shareholders and board of directors, and I, I would say rightly so, pulled the plug on that venture. Um, and we really looked after, looked at, we, we've got a good technology, but it takes all of the above in order to you know, mitigate climate change and deliver what needs to be delivered in terms of the energy transition and wave and uh, sorry and wind and solar on an ELCO basis and from a debt financing perspective are miles ahead of where grid scale wave power sits. So we pivoted pretty hard, you know, new, new board, new CEO, new CFO, entire new VP level. Um, and went after the smaller market. So we were able to utilize the underlying technology that we've got and the 20 odd years of first principles engineering that we did to tailor it to where there is an immediately very large market now. And the defense and security market and the oil and gas and power market it, it is that market. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you know, we opened an office down in Houston because we need to be close to where our customers are. 
because this they're here, they're in Aberdeen, they're in Stavanger, they're in Perth, um, they're in Lagos, Nigeria, um, and that is what we're going after. So it was a it was a conscious decision, and it really hits two things. It's not just the renewable power side of it, as, as many of the other panelists have said. It's also autonomy, because the ocean industry is rapidly going towards autonomous operations because it introduces, uh, A, it moves people out of harm's way and it introduces business resiliency. And the other bit is, selfishly, I think as Bill mentioned it to his talk, you need to find when you're building a company, a market that is large and chasing research dollars forever and a day isn't going to satisfy investors that at some point want to see a suitable ROI. So you need to go after a large market with deep pockets and oil and gas is probably one of those industries that have the most incentives to decarbonize. And, and that's, that's part of the reasons why we moved across. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Well, I think um, <clears throat> that's bringing us to our time. We've uh, pretty much hit it on the dot. So I want to take the time to thank our panelists. You were all really great and some great presentations. Thank you very much. And um, also thank you to uh, Elise and everyone involved for um, allowing me to be one of your uh, moderators. And we did it all within the, the exact right time. So kudos, guys. <laughs> thank you very much.